Okay. So, music performance anxiety. Um, it's better known as stage fright. It's something that everyone experiences um, in some way when they're a musician. Um, there are very, very few musicians who don't experience it. I would be, I would really like to meet you. I'd really love to talk if you've never experienced music performance anxiety. And there's some reasons for that uh, as we'll go forward. So, so a little bit about myself. I'm sure you all know me because you found me through many sources. Maybe I messaged you personally, but my name is Daniel. I've experienced a lot of music performance anxiety in my life. A lot of people don't know about this, this about me. They think that I've never experienced it, um, but I experience it all the time. Uh, and I, I continue to experience it. Um, I finished my music, my master's of music and my bachelor's of music at the University of Ottawa. Uh, I'm a registered music teacher with ORMTA, the Ontario Registered Music Teachers Association. I've played guitar for 18 years and I've been teaching for about 12. Uh, I've, I've done competitions and, and things like that. Uh, very, very high stress environments uh, I've been in and uh, you know, I, I've, I've used these tools in, in practice, in the field. Um, so I've spent a lot of time researching this topic for my Doctor of Musical Arts degree at the University of Toronto uh, with Jeffrey McFadden as my supervisor. And so I, I'm currently doing my doctorate at the, at the University of Toronto in guitar performance. Uh, and this is part of my doctoral research. This is basically a, a summation of the background research I've done on this particular topic. My uh, actual dissertation is on music pedagogy and music performance anxiety. So how teachers affect music performance anxiety. Uh, in their students. So I'll be talking a little bit about that in this as well. Okay, so there's two parts to this presentation. The first part is about understanding music performance anxiety. And the second part is about um, learning actual tools to deal with it. Okay, so that's Bruce Lee there. If you don't know that, he's great here on the line. Okay, so what is music performance anxiety? Um, it's defined as the presence of persisting, distressing apprehension and or actual impairment of performance skills in a public context to a degree unwarranted given the individual's musical aptitude, training, and level of preparation. So basically, music performance anxiety is when you are prepared and you go on stage and you have a horrible experience. So even if you are prepared and you've, you've gotten it really nice in the practice room and it sounded really great, you get in front of a bunch of people and your hands won't do what you want them to, or your voice won't do what you want it to. This happens to people very often. And this is really what music performance anxiety is. It's not just having a bad performance once or twice. It's about uh, actually being prepared and having a horrible experience. So in sports psychology, we describe this as choking under pressure. Uh, it's kind of a, an aggressive term, in my opinion, but uh, yeah. So it's, it's often called stage fright in, in dramatic arts. Uh, in psychiatry, we, we do have a, a, a name for this, uh, and uh, it's, it's called performance anxiety. Um, and this is under social anxiety, social phobia, in the Diagnostic Statistics Manual of the American Psych Psychiatric Association. So uh, they're listed as follows. Um, so you have to... Uh, be in a situation where you have uh, you're under scrutiny by others so other people are watching you typically colleagues who who know what you're doing um, often when we're performing we're performing for people who are in our field who are also musicians who we respect people are trying to impress uh, jury members uh, audience members record producing <laughs> uh, executives people like that uh, in the audience that so we, we don't know who's going to be in the audience so we always have this this fear of scrutiny um the individual fears that he or she will act in a way or show anxiety symptoms that will be negatively evaluated um they will be humiliating or embarrassing so a lot of uh one of the, one of the criteria is that people have to believe that whatever is happening is uh going to look bad on them what if i'm going to perform and I'm going to fail and everyone's going to make fun of me. No one's going to care about me anymore. People are going to dislike me. People are going to think I'm stupid. People are going to think I'm a terrible musician. Things like this. The social, uh, the social situations almost always provoke fear or anxiety. So um, this performance specifier that happens in social phobia is uh, not just for music performance anxiety. It's also for all types of performance anxiety. So 
It can be sexual performance anxiety. It can be musical performance anxiety. It can be um, uh, performance anxiety about uh, sports. It can be performance anxiety about any task that we have to perform in front of an audience. Public speaking is a, a very, very common one that everyone experiences. Um, so in children, um, they, they experience it very differently. Um, a lot of children will uh, not show music performance anxiety in a very obvious way, but when they get in front of their parents and you ask them to play for their parents or something, they will, they will regress to a younger form. I, I once had a student who was 10 years old and he, uh, I asked him to play for his mom and he immediately froze up and then kind of ran into her arms and then just started clutching her. And this sort of regression is very, very common uh, when people experience music performance anxiety in childhood. Um, and yes, it can be experienced in childhood. A common myth is that people don't experience MPA until they're much older. But actually, people who are uh, as young as four can experience this. Okay, so MPA in the DSM-5. And feel free to ask any questions if you have any. So the DSM-5 is the Diagnostic Statistics Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. This is what they use to diagnose all of the mental disorders, um, all of the mental illnesses that exist. Um, the social situations are avoided or endured with intense fear or anxiety. The fear or anxiety is out of proportion to the actual threat. Of course, when we're performing in public for people, uh, no one is actually going to get hurt if we fail. We are not going to be hurt if we fail. We're not going to be physically injured. Um, and most likely our fears are out of proportion with reality. Uh, so there's, there's always this element to it. Um, the fear, anxiety, or avoidance is persistent, typically lasting for six months or more. So if you have a stream of performances for six months and you experience this constantly, then you might have music performance anxiety. The fear, anxiety, or avoidance causes clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important, important areas of functioning. Fear, anxiety, or avoidance is not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance or another medical condition. So um, you're not on drugs while this is happening, or you're not drunk while this is happening. Um, it's not caused by these things. Um, so the fear, anxiety, or avoidance is not better explained by the system, systems of another mental disorder, such as panic disorder, body dysmorphic disorder, or autism spectrum disorder. Um, And this is kind of a disclaimer. So uh, the, the, it's only performance anxiety, again, if it happens within one specific medium. And this is very focal. So if somebody experiences music performance anxiety, they might only experience music performance anxiety with a specific medium that they're working with. For example, if someone is a conductor, they might have very little anxiety going in front of a bunch of people and conducting an orchestra, but they might be terrified to perform on the piano. Um, it, it can be very focal that way. Uh, the use, so there are three categories of symptoms that we that we say in music performance anxiety. So there's the physiological, there's the cognitive, and the behavioral symptoms. And so the physiological symptoms are essentially what your body does. Those are the ones we know most commonly. Those are the uh, sweating, those are um, getting cold hands when you're when you're about to play. Those are um, all all the myriad things that your body does when it reacts to a threat. Um, a lot of people have increased tension when they're performing or increased tension in general. Um, some people have dizziness, nausea, vomiting. Horowitz was famous for regularly vomiting before his concerts. Uh, tachycardia is the heart racing. Uh, and then with cognitive symptoms, these are the what ifs we say to ourselves. These are the things uh, we say, and these can be incredibly creative. Um, so if you have any that you might experience that might be very interesting, um, please feel free to add them in the chat. Um, these include catastrophizing. These are this that's like um, imagining the worst thing could happening, um, worrying about the future, worrying about other people's opinions, uh, and worrying about in general scenarios that could happen. What if I get on stage, and I completely drop my bow if you're a violinist and everyone, you know, I have to stop the piece. What if I get on stage and I have a massive memory slip and I mess up in front of everyone? What if I get on stage and people start booing? What if I get on stage and 
there's there's no end to the possibilities and they can be quite interesting and creative um the more active your imagination is uh, and then there are behavioral symptoms behavioral symptoms are the ones we we think about the least those are the ones that uh actually alter the way you behave before and after performance so before a performance people will often have a different uh oh yeah you get cold hands it's a very common one um, and these ones, these physiological ones, they, they do have kind of quick fixes for some of them. Um, for cold hands, you can do push-ups. It increases your circulation. Uh, one of the reasons why we have cold hands when we play is because, not because your hands are physically cold, but it's because the circulation is cut off in your hands. So when you're playing, um, because of the tension, the, the blood flow is not going towards your hands. So if you do an activity that will increase your blood flow, uh, like doing push-ups, like doing sit-ups, like doing any kind of physical activity, kicks, punches, um, they will actually very quickly uh, restore your circulation and, and you can actually kind of fix that. Um, shaking, trembling is very hard to manage. That's one that people have to um, become aware of and move through. Um, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, these are quite severe. Uh, these are not always uh, manageable without pharmacological solutions. Sometimes people take anti nauseants before they perform, for example. Um, so the, back to the behavioral symptoms. The behavioral symptoms include over-practicing, not practicing, um, not sleeping, oversleeping, not eating, overeating, irritably, irritable behaviors with friends, spouse, hiding from the world, substance abuse a lot of people uh the hiding from the world is very interesting I, I notice a lot of people will say i'm going into hermitage now and they they kind of uh cut themselves off from everyone in their life so that they can totally focus on practicing um i, I once saw a great pianist um who was a prophet one of the schools i used to teach used to say that he would um just practice for seven hours a day and his partner would basically take care of all his needs for that time uh, which is very bizarre um so a lot of a lot of very very neurotic symptoms we have here yeah uh they are overlooked as part of the culture i think that's a really good point anatole uh i think that we have a, a culture of, of of hustling and a lot of times when we see people who are um hiding away or we see people who are withdrawing from from society or they're overworking themselves um we will actually reward them for that behavior by kind of celebrating their dedication, by celebrating how hard they're working. Um, when in fact they might not be working efficiently, it doesn't say anything about the quality of the work they're doing. It actually doesn't say whether they're actually getting results from this. Uh, all it tells you is that they're not there. Um, and that can be very dangerous because some of the behavioral symptoms that aren't mentioned very often include um, quitting music altogether or uh, committing suicide. Um, these are actually very, very serious things that, that happen uh, more often than, than most people are willing to admit. Um, a lot of musicians just cannot handle that they aren't able to live up to the expectations they have for themselves. And uh, these kinds of behaviorals are naturally out of sync with regular reality. They're out of proportion to the actual scenario. Um, and it's, it's kind of a delusional mentality that takes over. Um, it's, it's very, very common. So it's very, very serious. Music performance anxiety is not a joke. Um, yeah. And substance abuse is the last one we didn't talk about. So how many people do you know who drink after a performance or drink um, in order to practice or to they take um, stimulants in order to keep practicing? This is very common. Um, so we have a case study. This is kind of funny, a little bit more lighthearted. I don't know if you've ever, this is, this might not uh, relate to the older members of the audience, but there is a song by Eminem called uh, called Lose Yourself. And uh, he describes music performance anxiety in a kind of picture perfect way. Uh, so I can kind of wrap it for you. 
Palms are sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy, there's vomit on his sweater already. Mom's spaghetti, he's nervous, but on the surface he looks calm and ready to drop bombs. But he keeps on forgetting what he wrote down, the whole crowd grows so loud. He opens his mouth, but the words won't come out. He's choking now, everybody's joking now, the clock's run out, time's up, over blouse. Snap back to reality, oh, there goes gravity, oh, there goes rabbit. He choked, he's so mad, but he won't give up that easy, no, he won't have it. He knows his whole back so these ropes. It don't matter, he's dope, he knows that, but he's broke, he's so stacked that he knows When he goes back to his mobile home, that's when it's back to the lab again Yo, this whole Rhapsody, he better go capture this moment, hope it don't pass him So that's that's really kind of a, a whole plethora of uh, symptoms that are, are happening and, and virtually every line of this song is talking about a different element of music performance anxiety Whether it's behavioral, cognitive or physiological, which is pretty crazy. Thanks, Greg. Uh, my rapping skills are, are in development right now. Um, yes, it's not part of my doctoral thesis, but I'm sure I can implement it somewhere. Um, so yeah, you can see here, um, you can see his physiological symptoms. There's vomiting, there's uh, outer experiences contradict inner experience. He's nervous, but on the surface, he looks calm and ready to drop bombs. This is a very interesting one that we don't always think about. Often people will tell me specifically when I go on stage, oh, you don't look nervous. You don't look like you've ever um, been nervous on stage. But actually, uh, we, we learn to develop a mask, much like an actor does, in order to sort of um, portray the, the confidence that we feel inside. And so this is able to um, be integrated into us. And, and so when people see us on stage, they think we're not nervous, but inside the same things are happening. It's still, uh, yeah, it's an iceberg. Um, yeah. One thing, we'll, we'll get to that, the idea of, of actually managing the symptoms versus eliminating the symptoms. Um, yeah. Okay. Keep going. So I, I want to ask, I want to ask the crowd here, um, how does MPA affect you specifically? Physiologically, cognitively, behaviorally? What are some, some ideas? So we already have some people, um, one person says, I get cold hands. Ali, it's nice. Um, what what are some of the be behavior uh, physiological symptoms people typically experience? Anyone here? Dry mouth. That's a good one. Yeah, for the saxophone, right, right. For the wind ensemble, the wind players. Um, that's a very very common one, of course. Um, that that's an interesting one because it's one that most string players might not relate to so much, but uh, maybe we still do experience it and we just don't notice because it's not something that actually affects our performance as much. The hands feel too light, like like they like you can't move them or you don't have control over them. Interesting, interesting. And and the people, some of the people in this, I'm not going to name names specifically, but some of the people who are responding right now are really wonderful musicians who I respect. Um, this is something that we all experience. This is I really want to reiterate that over and over and over. N nobody here is really free of this. And actually, our music performance anxiety isn't always a bad thing. It's not something that we need to necessarily eliminate. It's uh, something that actually tells us a lot about how much we care. Over-practicing, catastrophizing, hard to describe. Tension in shoulders. Right, they'd rather take a test than sing it. Right, right. This is a very, very, very keen observation. Uh, I noticed that, well, we, we'll get to this very quickly. We'll talk about perfectionism and how it affects music performance anxiety and how it actually um, defeats the purpose of what we're trying to achieve. A lot of times people have such a high level of perfectionism that they would rather not pursue the activity than go on living a world where they don't actually meet their own expectations. Tension, for sure. Very interesting. Okay. So, overeating? That's that's one we missed. Very, very good. Nice. Under-practicing? Overeating is a big one, for sure. I always notice I eat a lot more during the performance and before the performance is coming up because I, uh, you know, I just want to take my mind off it. We call that experiential avoidance. Um... There have been tears. Yes, there have been tears. 
there have definitely been tears. Yes. Very, very interesting. Some behavioral symptoms? Or some, some more behavioral symptoms? Don't be shy. Everyone is in this together. Shaking of the hands so much that I always strike the wrong notes at the beginning of a piece. This is very, very common. So the physiological ones, we can uh, we can often have like a kind of small trick that, that works for these tiny things. The shaking is very difficult, but uh, I, I find that if we bring ourselves to practice the first notes of the piece very, very intensely, uh, it will really, really help us. Um, it, it, and that sounds kind of obvious, right? Um, just practice it. But uh, when we first perform on stage, I always imagine it's like jumping into a diving, uh, jumping off a diving board on a high dive. You know, uh, for someone who isn't trained in swimming, you know that's that's a pretty scary experience. You're 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 flying off the diving board and then you land in the water, and uh, you there's a moment of disorientation that happens when we first land in the water. We don't really know how to find the the the, the surface, and we're uh, kind of scrambling for a moment, and then we find our moment, and then we we reach the surface, and then we can swim as normally. But that's kind of what I feel uh, performing can be like in the first moments. So there is a moment of disorientation when we first start, and so practicing going into that moment of disorientation can really help us. Uh, Sleepiness, normally a nap, nap before. I see everyone has a completely different reaction. Rocking on stage. Yes, definitely rocking on stage. Irritability. I don't want to talk to people. You know, I used to be afraid of touching people, like uh, getting near them. I couldn't shake their hand. I couldn't do anything before I would play. Very bizarre things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So generous. So, so many great answers here. Uh, do you... I mean, I think the answer is clear here. Do, do you think you might experience MPA um, if you didn't think you had it before? I'm sure you probably wouldn't be here if you didn't think that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go past that one. And uh, if you... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Let's keep going. I remember that. What, what, what specifically do you remember? Oh, you remember? Yeah, actually, that that was involved. One time I did that with you. I think uh, we were in a competition, and I, you you asked to shake my hand, and uh, I I was like, no, I don't touch others before I play. <laughs> some some crazy thing like this. I I'm not like this anymore. I've really worked through a lot of the things, but I, I still experience it. It's fine. Okay. Why do the symptoms of MPA happen? Oh, interesting. That makes sense. That makes sense. Of course, you're on edge. You're preparing for a threat. You're preparing to respond to a threat. So that makes perfect sense. Nausea. Nausea. There we go. Yeah. Cool. So what do the symptoms... Why do the symptoms of MPA happen? We're getting here now. Um, uh, the answers might surprise you. Um, so... One of, one of the answers from evolutionary biology is the idea that uh, the, uh, the only time that you're in front of a large group of mammals uh, in an enclosed setting is when you're about to be murdered <laughs> or eaten. Right? So it's very, very rare for us to be in that kind of situation traditionally in the wild. So we naturally respond like it's an army or it's a herd of predators about to eat us. Um, or maybe a, like a bunch of stampeding wildebeest or something. This is always a very scary experience. And we have a Celtic battle syndrome, we call it. Um, it's the feeling that um, you don't know what's what's behind you, but um, you, you're, you're preparing for a threat because there's all these things in front of us um, that we're, we're pre preparing for. So it's very, very scary. Um, the executive function is interfering. Of course, we have um, all these intrusive thoughts that appear with us on our daily basis but we might not always notice them. And when we enter a performance, we tend to go into a state of hyper-awareness. And when we go into the state of hyper-awareness, we don't always realize how loud our intrusive thoughts are. And suddenly we come into contact with them in a way that we haven't necessarily before. And it's in the context of being in front of 
a large army of people. And so we naturally have a, a quite severe reaction. And the executive function is the part of our brain that's the prefrontal cortex that is basically our, our thinking, judging brain. That's the part of us that makes uh, critical decisions. Um, and this part of our brain will often tell us things. We'll make judgments that will say, this is good, this is bad, this is terrible, you're going to mess up. What if you mess up? That was great. It will celebrate you and it will also uh, attack you. So there are uh, the goal of optimal functioning is to turn that aspect of our brain off. Uh, and that's, that's what you see when people go into flow. And we'll talk about that soon. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Alex. That's a really, that's a really powerful one. Yeah. And, and this is kind of the difficult thing about music performance anxiety. The irony is that we wouldn't be doing music or, or working so hard at music unless we really cared. Um, but it actually takes us away from the things that we really care about. Um, and that's, that's really difficult. Um, one of the reasons we experience MPA is because we want to please our parents. Uh, so often when we start music lessons, especially when we start at a very young age, uh, we will be doing it not necessarily for our own intrinsic motivations, but for an extrinsic motivation. So we're doing it for other people, to please other people, to please people in our lives, to please our parents, caregivers, teachers, and things like that. Not necessarily caring about our own feelings about the piece. How many times have you played a piece that you didn't even like um, for an audience you didn't know uh, in order to please our parents? It's very awesome, very common one. Took me an extra year to graduate college, pass all my tests in class, but could pass my jury for my senior recital on trombone. Right. Yeah, and sometimes it takes us, it, it prevents us from, from achieving our goals in the time we want them to, but that's okay. As, uh, I think that congratulations for actually going through with it. Um, you, you, yeah, it's really, it's really brave. And it, and it shows us that it's really challenging to go on stage in general. I mean, every time we do that, we're taking a risk and it's, it's worth it. So this brings me to the last answer. I think this is the most important one. We're a human being. Uh, we all experience, um, these sorts of things. Um, this is a sort of common experience. Um, what, one that I didn't include there, um, and probably the most important of all is that, oh, I, I see. I couldn't pass. Uh, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's very challenging. Performing on stage is very challenging. It can, it can be really, really difficult. And there's a lot of mental baggage that we have to get through in order to do it. But one of the reasons we experience music performance anxiety uh, is because we actually care so much. Um, and it might not actually be for those extrinsic motivations for our parents or other people. It, it's often because we care about the music. We care about what we're doing. We think that what we are doing has value and importance and the reaction you have to performing on stage uh, is in proportion to how much you care about performing so if you didn't care about performing it didn't matter to you whether the quality of your performance was was high or low then it would be impossible to experience musical performance anxiety because it wouldn't matter to us. It would just be like walking down the street. Um, it, would, it would just be another activity. And it wouldn't give us any kind of arousal in our mind. It wouldn't actually affect us. Um, it wouldn't cause us to have a, a reaction because it, it's not really something interesting. But because it's something interesting, because it's something we care about, because it's something that we actually might associate with our identity, uh, it becomes very, very important to us and it, and it affects us very strongly. Um, yeah. Oh, you can't read the comments from other platforms. Okay, I see, I see, I see. Sorry about that. I see, yeah. Okay, some, some people from Twitch were responding, I see. Yeah, so there was uh, one from Alex. He said, I've had so much MPA that I've often reconsidered auditioning for performance just to avoid a recital. 
I also avoid playing in master classes as much as possible. It is something that I deeply regret because I know they would make me a better musician and give me crucial experience. Uh, K. Fodges said, took me an extra year to graduate college, passed all my tests in class, but could not pass my jury for my senior recital on trombone. Thanks for that, Alex. I, I wasn't actually aware of that. I'm looking through this on multi-stream, so I'm seeing all of the different answers from all the different platforms, but uh, it's not always clear whether it's from Facebook or not. Okay, thanks so much. All right, so yeah, again, our values are one of the reasons why we experience this. Okay. So here are some famous musicians who have struggled with MPA that you might not have thought about. Chopin. Chopin had crippling anxiety when it came to performing. Actually, he stopped performing altogether because of it. Um, Barbara Streisand quit singing for over 20 years because she had a terrible performance uh, breakdown in Central Park in New York, and she stopped playing. Cher also had very intense music performance anxiety. This is very interesting. If you've ever heard of Sonny and Cher, this is, uh, this is very old for the youngest people, um, but it was long before my time too. But Sonny and Cher was a was a duo with Cher before she got famous, you know, in the sort of solo act that we know. And she would always sing to Sonny, her husband. She would always be singing at him, and it was kind of like a romantic thing, and everyone would sort of, you know, think it was a really special kind of relationship they had because they were husband and wife. But it wasn't that she was looking into his eyes. It was that she was actually trying to hide from the audience by looking at him. It's very interesting. Eddie Van Halen had music performance anxiety pretty intensely. He would sometimes um, face away from the audience when he was playing because he was so nervous. Brian Wilson from the uh, the Beach Boys. Uh, Adele actually <laughs> regularly vomits before she plays, which is hilarious because you don't really think about her being a nervous person. She's such an incredible performer. Ozzy Osbourne bit the head off a bat, but he's afraid of performing on stage. Uh, Lord, Mariah Carey, Pablo Casals used to, was actually treated for music performance anxiety when he was younger. Arthur Rubinstein. So, uh, so the the prevalence. Um, Thirty percent of orchestral musicians in Australia use beta blockers to deal with MPA. Um, beta blockers are a type of heart medication that people use for heart palpitations, and um, if you take them, they can sometimes reduce the uh, the edge when you're performing. People say like it's kind of like it, it allows you to perform, but without the uh, intensity that is usually accompanied by the arousal that happens. Um, we there are natural beta blockers they say in bananas. I actually, actually haven't confirmed whether that's real, but a lot of musicians will eat bananas before they play because of this. When does it start? So as early as age four. Uh, the median age for symptoms to develop is age 13. Um, that's when they start to get really serious and really, really noticeable. Um, because again, children aren't always very good at uh, communicating their thoughts. As we get older and we, our identity starts to become stronger and more clearly formed, uh, it becomes more obvious that someone has music performance anxiety, especially when they're juggling the challenges of, of developing an identity, um, the transition from parents to peers as the most important figures. Uh, very interesting. Okay, uh, some predicting factors for music performance anxiety uh, include um, perfectionism. Perfectionism is the number one thing that predicts music performance anxiety. So self-oriented perfectionism, other-oriented perfectionism, and world-oriented perfectionism. We say, oh, I can remember the day it happened. I was 12. Nate says, thank you. That was, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's around that time. So, um, so we have these three forms of perfectionism. And self-oriented perfectionism is just uh, the expectation that I will be um, I, I, the expectations that are extremely high for ourselves. And then there are other oriented perfectionism, which is just as common, which is having really high expectations of other people, especially other performers. These tend to go hand in hand. 
And when somebody has self-oriented perfectionism and other-oriented perfectionism, um, they, they tend to be around the same amount. So people who have really high expectations of other performers uh, will often have very high expectations of themselves as well. And sometimes they're often projecting. Um, I know a lot of musicians who won't go to concerts or are never impressed by concerts or just never enjoy music concerts because they can hear people making mistakes and it just it just drives them insane. Um, they, they can't even listen to recordings sometimes because they, they just can't handle that there are so many mistakes. Um, and that's mostly a projection of their own experience with self-oriented perfectionism. Um, there's also world-oriented perfectionism, which is expecting the world to be better, to be perfect, being constantly disappointed. Um, so obviously, right. So I know um, K. Fodger says, I know they hate middle school then. Lol. Yes. So most people experience it very strongly in, in uh, middle school. And this is important because the 12 to 13 gap uh, for anyone who has music students is actually the most difficult time for students uh, in terms of dropout rates so in music the time people usually drop out of music is around 12 to 13 um, 11 to 13 sometimes some studies that that's a very very big dropout rate uh, 18 is another one for university but because of the prevalence of anxiety uh, that that could be one of the reasons why why that happens um, okay so perfectionism is a double-edged sword um, we can't just say that it's all bad just because it causes music performance anxiety doesn't mean it's all bad. Um, it, it's associated with high self-efficacy. Uh, it's associate, associated with um, uh, high-level performers and athletes and also academics. Uh, it's associated with intrinsic motivation. And, and the truth is, you if you've ever gotten to a very high level in music, it probably is largely attributed to your perfectionism so it's not always a bad thing it means that you have high standards for yourself and you are very exacting about what you want and so that means that of course it will have some improvements for you but at a certain point perfectionism starts to become inefficient because it starts to prevent us from taking any kind of risks or uh, facing any kinds of challenges because we expect that we will fail um, the process of learning an instrument is often a perfectionistic endeavor itself. Uh, of course, we spend our entire musical lives with our teachers learning how to see the flaws in what we're playing, um, to see flaws in our posture, to see flaws in our sound, to see flaws in the way we deliver the music, in our reading ability, in all of these different things. And in fact, most teachers use a, a deficit based model of teaching where they actually find the mistakes and they say correct them oh there's a mistake correct it uh you weren't doing this at this place correct it instead of adding something to the music and in fact this is an important point to make because if we only take things away from the music and we only remove mistakes from the music then we actually won't improve our performance necessarily. If someone is free of illness, it doesn't necessarily mean they're healthy. And so we actually have to add something in order to improve our playing. To have an optimal performance, we actually need to add something to the music. Alex says, I never recorded anything during my undergrad for fear of showing mistakes. I regret it deeply today. It's very, very difficult, yes. It prevents us from taking a lot of challenges. Classical musicians might experience this in a more pronounced way. So if anyone's ever done classical music, I think most of the people in this group are classical musicians, um, it does seem to be worse with them. And I think this, anecdotally, you might say that this is because of the culture. This is also because of uh, the expectations on classical musicians to perform perfectly and uh, to perform in venues like competitions, to play in venues where they're trying to achieve a perfectionism, to um, perform a cover, essentially, of other people's music, of composers like Beethoven, like Mozart, Brahms, Bach, and to play them flawlessly, uh, rather than play our own pieces or make our own music. 
which is much more common in jazz and other styles, or to make the music our own. This is not really as, as much of a thing. There is an element of that in classical music, and it's important that people you know, develop an interpretation of a piece, but the differences between interpretations are much more subtle than they are in other musical styles. So. So, uh, so other predictors of music performance anxiety include a shy, introverted temperament at a young age. If you're shy or you're a quiet kid, you might have had it much more intensely. Uh, if you've had a significant performance breakdown, that's basically like if you've ever been in a performance that felt basically traumatizing, uh, you might uh, do a lot of things to avoid experiencing that again. And it might become quite strong uh, later on. Uh, as I mentioned, Barbara Streisand had a performance breakdown where she sort of, um, she missed a high note, I think, and she cracked, her voice cracked or something. Uh, and she, you know, gave up singing for 20 years as a result. So uh, people who have these kinds of experiences are if you've ever had these kinds of experiences, I think we all have to some degree, it, it's very, very difficult to recover from. And you'll often find yourself um, remembering the moment over and over and over. I, I know I can remember some performances I've given. I, I One is coming to mind, in my mind. Um, and uh, the performance was just so bad that I, I think about it daily when I'm walking down the street sometimes, or I'm just, you know, in the kitchen or something. And it, it hits me so strongly that it's, I have to just stop for a moment. If you've ever had a moment like that, that's probably because you had a performance breakdown and it still affects you today. Um, Alex says, my MPA appeared when I first played in front of my students when I was 16. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That's an audience that's scrutinizing you. You, you want to play well for your students. You want to show them how cool a guitar is. You want to show. You want to inspire them, and so it's very, uh, very high pressure. Actually, we can we can feel that a lot of times. Okay. Uh, abusive and arbitrary teachers. This 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 last point doesn't get enough attention, in my opinion. Uh, abusive and arbitrary teachers can do a lot of damage and have a strong role to play in this process. Um, this is part of my music performance anxiety research. Uh, we often find that teachers who uh, have an arbitrary teaching style, and what I mean by that is they will be hot and cold in their judgments, and their judges won't always be predictable. So um, I, I know one story of a violinist who uh, came in to lessons regularly and would be told she was an awful musician, she was an awful player, and she'll never make a career in music. And then she would come in the next day and practice really hard so they can impress the teacher. And then they would play not very well. And the teacher would, you know, celebrate them and say, oh, you're, you're wonderful. You, you have exactly what it takes to become this person. So uh, that kind of arbitrary teaching style where, where they kind of leave you on a hook is a, a kind of abusive teaching style. And we uh, associate that with other things like Stockholm Syndrome battered wife syndrome uh those are situations where people are arbitrary they're they're mean most of the time but they are nice every once in a while in such a way that the student feels indebted to the teacher the student feels a, a, a lack of confidence um and they're trying desperately to find those moments in the teacher where they can see that that goodness in them that is apparently there um this is really, really difficult for a lot of people. Um, if you've ever experienced this kind of teacher, it can do a lot of damage. I, I definitely had a teacher like this uh, in my undergrad, and it was very difficult. Um, so I have since, yeah, it took me a long time to recover from that. Uh, an anxious attachment style is a very common thing for people who have um, music performance anxiety. That's a type of attachment style where um, people will try desperately to get attention and then they will be suddenly withholding uh, with people who deny them in any sort of way. Um, it can be intensely insecure and things like this. Um, so Maria says, 
I have experienced this firsthand. My teacher would encourage me and send me very nice text messages after lessons. Approaching grad auditions, she decided I needed to improve drastically and became very passive aggressive. I did not feel like I ever pleased her enough during lessons. Kay Fab just says, I can sing, dance, teach, and act with hardly any anxiety, but after uh, I because um music ed, ed because I became a music ed major, I couldn't play trombone alone. I see. So that that's a great example of how the focal aspect of music performance anxiety can be so strong. You said you can sing, dance, teach, and act with hardly any anxiety, but after uh when he became a music ed major, uh, playing trombone was very difficult, even even by yourself. I understand. It's a it's a very common thing. Um, okay. So other things that can predict it include genetic factors. So if your parents were anxious, you might also be very anxious when it comes to performing. And performance anxiety, like I said, is an as a subset of social anxiety or social phobia. So. It really is very linked to generalized anxiety and other anxiety uh, types. So if you've experienced any other kind of anxiety, the chances of you having music performance anxiety are very high. And if your parents have had it, likewise. Okay. So I have some questions for everybody here. Everybody is so uh, generous with their answers. I really, really appreciate the honesty and the bravery that it takes to actually say these things in this kind of forum. It's really, really kind. Um, and you're really helping everyone by saying these things. Uh, have you ever experienced a performance breakdown in the past? What was it like? Have you ever had a per performance breakdown again? Is when the performance kind of crashes and you might have to stop or you might have a memory slip and the whole thing has to stop or the performance was just like really, really not good and you were not feeling good about yourself. Has anyone had this experience? Um, while, while people are typing, I'll, I'll say um, I experienced one of these uh, very intensely when I was applying for my doctoral degree uh, at the University of Toronto. I did very well and I felt very happy with myself. But uh, in two days before, I auditioned to McGill and I uh, probably gave the worst performance I've ever given proportionate to my preparation in my entire life. And uh, I, I had a massive memory slip in the middle of a massive fugue. Uh, the, the Bach violin sonata number three uh in c major and it was quite disastrous actually everything that i planned to do kind of failed and it was really really awful and i can remember that memory every single day of my life <laughs> I can, it, it can it can come back in regular experiences um and i remember uh just feeling like um nearly uh, i i remember the the anxiety was so strong that i would often uh you know, I, I would, you know, have suicidal ideation and things like that because it was, it was so intense. I thought my career was over, things like this. Because there was a jury of like four people and they were all very distinguished musicians. Uh, and then I played in Toronto three days later and I felt prepared and everything went very well. Um, so I didn't really have much time to prepare in between those things and traveling. Uh, so it's very bizarre that... So. Have you ever had a teacher that told you to come back when it's perfect without explaining what that means? That's another example of that arbitrary teaching style. Um, having having unclear expectations or having expectations that are unreasonable. First time, I, Nate says, <laughs> first time I played for Pavel, Pavel Steidel is a great Czech guitarist. I completely face planted. We ended up working on rookie things instead of actually talking about music. Uh, that, that, that That's happened to me before as well. Um, you play in a master class and you don't give a great performance. And then the person in the master class starts working on very basic things with you. It's, it's, it happens sometimes. It's very, very humiliating sometimes because all you want to do is get off the stage and forget about it. But you're stuck there for 30 minutes being told how to play the piece better by the uh, great performer in front of a large audience. Alex says, I once played Scarlatti for Alvaro Pieri and I completely blanked on a repeat sign and stopped mid B section. It was so embarrassing. This is very, uh, very common. Hey, Sir Katoblapa. Hello on Twitch. Um, he asked me if I practiced every day. 
Oof, that's rough. Yeah, sometimes they will, the perf- the teachers will not always realize how hard you're working to do these things. And sometimes they won't always realize how much preparation you've put in. Okay, Faja says, I remember being so self-conscious when it came to repertoire and having to play in front of all the other trombone players every Monday. My private instructor wasn't very welcoming, and he actually even suggested that I didn't take my instruments seriously and probably should switch to vocal. Wow. I went to school to become a music teacher, so I wasn't really trying to be a performance major as well, but I ended up switching up, switching schools. Wow. It's really difficult. And, you know, there's a lot of, well, we'll get to this later, but there's a lot of counter-transference and transference that happens between teacher and student that's not always talked about. Sarah says, classical piano performance. I had a total memory loss and couldn't get back on. Had to walk off and get the sheet music. Worst feeling ever haunts me. This is this is a common performance breakdown. Yeah, you're not alone in this one. Patrick says, I was coming down with a cold flu last November and had planned to give a recital on Remembrance Day. I was playing probably the most difficult piece in my repertoire, Maurice Durufle's Prelude and Fugue on Alain. Wow, that's a hard piece. His Requiem is really good. And I was really sick when performing. I broke down in the middle of the fugue, completely stopped for a few seconds, and really thought I couldn't go on. Finished the piece, but found it really hard to live with myself afterwards. Yeah, I... I definitely relate to that. I think I think we've all experienced that as well. Uh, finding it very difficult to live with yourself afterwards. Wishing you could repeat the experience over and again. Like you could go in a time travel machine and, and see the world again and, and go through it again. It's very, very challenging. But we, we'll get to some I- ideas we can use to prevent performance breakdowns and to survive performance breakdowns. Is there anybody else with any ideas with with any 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 other experiences you want to share? Man, I'm I'm really loving how how generous everyone is in the chat. Okay. Has your teacher ever arbitrarily insulted your playing without giving you clear instructions for what to improve? Um, by arbitrary insults, I, I you can also give arbitrary compliments as well. Uh, these are Compliments that have more to do with the character of the individual or the personality of the individual or the identity of the individual than it is with the medium they're working with, which is music. So instead of saying, can you please uh, play with a clearer phrasing in bar five, they say, your phrasing sucks. You're a terrible musician you're not going to make it as a performer. Consequently, you can also have an abusive compliment, which is, your playing is magnificent. Or, not your playing is magnificent. You are magnificent. You're, mu- you're a mu- magnificent musician. Um, you're a great player. You're a great musician. Um, things like this. Uh, these These are, they might seem very complimentary, and they might seem very kind but they don't actually help us improve our playing they're not actually a criticism that say anything about our character they actually um the the, our musicianship and our character are not actually related you can be a terrible person and play very well and you can be a very good person and play very terribly there's there's no relationship between your character your ethics and your musicianship um so if someone only mentions your character or they only mention your identity or they only mention who you are as a person instead of mentioning the thing that they're trying to improve then the compliment is useless and it's actually uh, unhelpful and the same thing obviously with with an insulting compliment so has your teacher ever arbitrarily insulted your playing without giving you clear instructions for what to improve Um, I've often heard you play like a, you play like, yeah, and then insert insult here. Um, Even expletives. 
Okay? So um, in the original version, we took a short break. But if everybody's ready to keep going, I think we can. Because you're at home, it's pretty relaxing. You can be wherever you are. Okay? So now we can transition into part two, which is managing the beast. I've talked to you a lot about what music performance anxiety is. It kind of revealed a lot of things you already knew about it. Before we continue, um, Maria says, My teacher has in the past critiqued the way I speak and would warn me that it will negatively influence my vocal technique. She did not provide sufficient advice for how to effectively change or improve my speaking voice. This really hurt my self-esteem and felt like it was associated with my identity. Absolutely. We'll often have teachers try to criticize the way people walk, the way people move, the way people do very basic things in their life. Um, you'll often tell them that uh, they have to do certain things in order to change themselves without having any psychiatric training or psychology, psychological training or anything like that. Uh, and, and it can be very, very unhelpful. It's important that if you are a teacher that you talk specifically about what it is that needs to improve. Bar five, the phrasing needs to be more clear. And further, clarify the statement by saying play louder here play quieter here my mom says very informative <laughs> i hope it is very informative okay so part two managing the beast real strategies to help you become the musician you want to be so some practical considerations of course we can't talk about this without talking about practicing so taking care of your mental health is going to help you a lot. Eating well, sleeping well, exercising can go a long way. Obviously, we need to take care of our mental health um, because this is a mental health challenge that we all experience as musicians. And so doing the optimal things to improve your mental health will improve your music performance anxiety. Um, some things I want to clarify is performing on stage is not magic. You can't um, say a spell before you perform on stage in order to play well if you haven't done any kind of work. And I think we, uh, the people who are very advanced already know this. Um, if you've ever gone on stage and you just don't know the words or you don't know the song or you don't know the piece, um, then of course it's not going to go well when we get on stage. If we've never been able to play it cleanly or to our satisfaction at home, then it's unreasonable for us to expect to be able to perform it well in front of an audience. So it's important that our practice regime uh, is clear and consistent enough that we can actually have repeatable results in the practice room. So again, I want to say that again, if you can't do it in the practice room, then it's unreasonable for us to expect to do it on stage. Um, flow exists, things like this exist, and we'll talk about them, but they cannot exist if the level of proficiency hasn't been achieved in the practice room so cool if you yeah All right um avoid keeping an unlimited agenda so this is something i should have talked about right in the beginning an eliminative agenda is the desire to eliminate your symptoms to make them go away entirely uh, a lot of people I think a lot of people who have come to this uh, may have had the misunderstanding that I was going to tell them secrets to remove their anxiety, um, to make them not feel sweaty when they get on stage, to not tremble when they get on stage, to not um, have anxious thoughts before they get on stage, to not behave differently when they get on stage. These things largely can be identified and managed, but there will always be a baseline level of anxiety that exists when we perform on stage. They, it cannot necessarily be eliminated. There's really no evidence that that can be eliminated. And again, I want to reiterate that that's not a bad thing. Um, the fact that we experience anxiety is a reflection of how much we care. It's a reflection of how much we want to do the thing we're doing, how much that thing matters to us, how much we value that thing. And so if we didn't experience anxiety, it would mean that we don't care. So if you don't experience anxiety about music, it means you don't care about music. So why are you even doing it? 
the fact that you're experiencing anxiety is a good thing in some ways because it's a reflection of your passion. It's a reflection of how much you care. Okay, so avoid keeping an eliminative agenda. Don't try to eliminate the symptoms. Try to manage the symptoms. Practicing is preparing for performing. So when we're practicing, it's important to uh, prepare for test runs that actually reflect a kind of ecologically valid scenario if you're in science or whatever. So uh, I mentioned earlier practicing the first moments of a piece to make us feel as if we are getting on stage and performing in front of a bunch of people. So rather than uh, sit with our guitar, which has already been on our hands for quite some time, and play through the piece right from the beginning, instead, to practice those first few minutes, stand up, walk over to some other room, and imagine someone is clapping. Uh, and imagine people are uh, applauding you. And turn on your recorder. A recorder is a very good substitute for an audience. And then walk up to the seat, sit down, and run your program. And the beginning moments will feel very, very different, even under that context. It's not very difficult to simulate a performance environment when you're in the practice room. A lot of times we are just so comfortable sitting where we are or being where we are that we don't remember that there is an audience we're preparing for. So it's important that we always have that as part of our regime. Um, you can find a lot of different examples of uh, things that can help you simulate a performance environment. Um, one of the things that I've been doing recently is playing on Twitch more often. Um, I use uh, the twitch.tv uh, concerts for the end of time uh, user page. I use that every day and I for all the Twitch users who are here, um, some, some people are follow me regularly. Hello. Um, for for Twitch, um, I, I perform li literally every day on that. And I've noticed that as I perform these big, scary pieces that were so big, um, I don't necessarily play them that much cleaner, but I, I am not afraid when I'm playing. I don't uh, feel the same intensity that I did before because I become used to the experience of being on stage. So it's important that we record ourselves when we practice. It's important that we play in front of others. And it's important that when we practice, we imagine scenarios where, where the audience is. Yes, Alex says, I find that spending a lot of time in the practice hall prior to performing helps a lot. Totally agree. Totally agree. A lot of guitarists have the luxury of being able to play in public spaces very easily. <laughs> we can just play in a boomy hall or in a staircase or something like this before we play and it sort of gets the nerves out. <laughs> it's very annoying to everybody else, but we're quiet enough that we can get away with it. You can also do it if you play any other instruments. I'm sorry, Greg, the saxophone would be difficult. But anyway, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Practicing and performing are also different skills. Uh, I also want to mention that as well. So when you're practicing, you're actually trying to cultivate the executive function. You're trying to actually work on improving the sound. You are judging actively. You are questioning what you're doing. You are actively um, using strategies to improve your playing through this. So we're not trying to um, just go with the flow or let the decisions happen. We're trying to make decisions. We're trying to actively decide this is how I want this phrase to go. This is the fingering I'm going to use. This is how, this is the way I want to pronounce this syllable. This is the way I want my voice to sound. This is the register I need to be in and so on. Um, these are important decisions that we make. And so that's what practicing is. It's actually the opposite of performing in many ways. Then when we perform, we can perform in the practice room and we can perform in front of people. And it should feel almost the same. When we're performing at home, we actually run the piece without using our judging mind. And we try as hard as we can to avoid making decisions while we're playing, to actually allow our mind to trust the preparation we've already made. So those are completely different things. Um, yeah, and, and that might be a controversial issue. If, if, if you disagree with that, please, please feel, feel free to, to, uh, to tell me so. I, I, 
Uh, I know not everybody feels the same about that, but that's, that's really strongly how I feel about it. Um, pay attention to your thoughts when you practice. This is one thing that we often don't do. And we're often rewarded for uh, not paying attention to our thoughts or allowing our thoughts to run out of control. So a lot of times we'll see performers who are practicing or they're in a master class and they're trying to run through something and they'll make a mistake and they'll <laughs> they'll say some kind of expletive like, fuck, and then they, they start playing again, right? Uh, we'll often say, wow, he cares so much. That's so, that's so, so interesting that they do the same thing. But actually, whatever is said by you out, out loud is kind of a magnification of whatever is happening inside. So it takes a lot for you to be thinking something inside for it to come out and for you to express it in words. So if you're playing and you swear at yourself or you tell yourself you're a terrible musician, um, you're probably thinking it much more inside. So make sure you pay attention to your thoughts and make sure you identify them. So meditation is a good way of doing this, but one strategy we use for meditation that doesn't necessarily have to be done while sitting, but can be done while playing, while practicing, um, is just seeing to yourself what the emotion you're feeling is or the sensation you're feeling is and using a verb to describe it. So we can say judging, 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 attacking, 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 questioning, 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 fearing, 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 and identifying the different experiences you're having. Uh, for some of my more anxious students, I will often tell them, uh, okay, identify this person as critical. Let's say the student's name is Jim, say critical Jim. And so they'll say, hello, goodbye. So they'll say hello to critical Jim, and they'll say goodbye to critical Jim. So they acknowledge the experience, they acknowledge the mental state, and then they acknowledge that it will pass. They acknowledge that it doesn't deserve their attention, that it's just another experience and it will move on. Um, sometimes they really stick and you have to repeat this many, many times, but this is a very, very, very useful strategy that not, not enough people talk about when they're practicing. Um, pay attention to the way you attack yourself when you're practicing because it destroys your confidence very subtly. You're, you actually do hear the way you talk to yourself and it will affect the way you play. So if you're telling yourself you're a garbage player or you're a garbage musician, you will start to feel that way. You will start to feel as if you've been attacked. And that's a really difficult thing to take into your music. It's very difficult to listen to and it makes it very hard to play freely. Um, one thing we can do is develop an exploratory approach to practicing and performing. So when we're practicing, uh, we can imagine that we're a child. And children are kind of annoying sometimes because they'll always ask us questions. They'll ask us questions over and over and over, and the questions will be random. They won't always have clear sequiturs. They'll be very strange. And they'll say, uh, what does that do? What does that do? What happens if I do this? What happens if I do this? And they're always experimenting. And when children are always experimenting, that's how they learn at the pace that they do. They're not trying to achieve a specific result. They're trying to ask questions. They're trying to see what will happen. And developing this exploratory approach will help you prevent that natural response we have to threats, which is to close off, to tighten our muscles, um, close in, and to become increasingly um, less efficient as a performer. Instead, it opens us up and makes us look at our reality with a little bit more humor, a little bit more fun, and to just sort of enjoy ourselves, you know? So, uh, so Kay Fodges says, I have learned to give my choral students numerous ways and opportunities perf to perform before the performance. To completely pass off a song to make it concert eligible, they must pass off their part as a section or alone that we must record as a class audio then video to analyze before it can be passed off video really helps them see their anxiety quirks totally um and this is this is really great 
Uh, because when you, when you throw someone into a performance and they haven't recorded themselves, they don't even know what they sound like. Suddenly they get this hyper awareness and it's so intense. So yeah, that, that, that's a great thing you're doing. You must be a really great teacher. You're, you're sharing so many great stories. It's really, really awesome. Really, really honest. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so yeah, developing this exploratory approach to practicing performing. The ability to objectively and constructively criticize your playing is a crucial and important skill. So this is in response to our perfectionism. Uh, often when we're criticizing ourselves, we'll do the same thing that that arbitrary teacher will do. Arguably, it could be because we've internalized the way they behave. So it's important to objectively and constructively criticize yourself. What does that mean? What it means is to clearly and accurately deal with the music itself and to criticize the way we're performing the music and not us ourselves. So instead of saying, oh, you're a garbage performer, you'll never get this, say, the way I played in bar five didn't reflect the phrasing I wanted to make. I made a mistake in the first beat of bar six and the note didn't sound. Let's try it again and so on. That's a very clear and constructive way to work with your playing and it's much more efficient. A lot of people think that the rougher they are with themselves, the more they will start to uh, improve, but this is actually not really the case at all. We have no evidence for this. Uh, there's being rough with yourself, being, being mean to yourself uh, without having a clear goal is not gonna achieve any of your objectives. So just be clear about the music. Don't be clear about you. Don't try to attack yourself. Um, similarly, if you if it goes well, don't say good job. Just say, oh, I liked what I did in bar five. I liked the way it sounded. Remember what to keep as well. That's an important thing to remember, to remember what to keep. Uh, because no matter how badly we play, even if, if we go in with any reasonable level of preparation, then even if we completely mess up everything, 80% of what we do is, should be there, right? It's probably still going to be there, 80%. 80% is not a great number when you're performing on stage, but it still is much more than the notes you missed. So it's important to realize that there, most of what you're doing is something you want to keep. It's something you want to stay with. Okay, cool. Um, so we have some exercises here. So um, the first one uh, we've already gotten to, these are some exercises you can try that can improve your playing if you want to go through them. Um, one is record yourself playing through a piece or song you are learning. Pretty obvious. Um, listen back and carefully record what you liked and what you would like to improve. So again, practice this objective and constructive criticism. Don't attack yourself. Don't say uh, bar five was garbage. Say bar five didn't sound the way I wanted to because of X, Y, and Z. Yes, Patrick Rue is one of the most admirable teachers. He, I, I also study with Patrick, Alex. Uh, yeah, we, we, yeah, me and Alex both study with him. And uh, Patrick is a great teacher because he always highlights what is to be kept. And this is very important for a number of reasons if you're a teacher. Uh, he says what he likes about your performance, no matter how bad it is. He starts with that. And he doesn't do that just to... Just to he reminds you what, what, you're, what you want to keep. But he also, um, he helps you open up when you might feel very vulnerable. If we have a performance that we don't really like, we tend to close off. And we don't really want to hear anybody's criticism. We don't want to hear what anybody has to say. Because we're criticizing us, ourselves so much that we can't take any outside criticism. So he'll just say, well, Dan, I don't really, um, what you did in bar five was sounding so nice. I love the clear phrasing, so beautiful. Now, you know, in bar six, uh, it didn't sound the way I wanted it to sound, but, uh, you know, we will work with it. Okay. So, again, he's, he's clearly, <laughs> this is the way he used to talk, he would clearly identify what he wanted to keep and throw away what he didn't want. And... The majority of what you do is something you want to keep. So just remember that. Okay. Listen back and carefully record what you liked and what you would like to improve using that objective criticism. Use objective language without insults or empty compliments. 
talk to yourself as if you would speak to your own student. It's a good rule of thumb. You know, you wouldn't abuse your students when you talk to them. Hopefully, you know, you wouldn't just attack them. Uh, you wouldn't just say, oh, you know, you were, um, you know, you're a terrible player or, or your, your performance was terrible. You would say, oh, well, I like what, what you did here. Let's improve this. Um, yeah. So one of the great ways to see if what you're doing is objective is to make smart goals. They're specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. So they're specific, measurable. You can you can tell whether or not it's it's been the case after you've you've tried the new thing. They're attainable, so they're within a reasonable expectation. Not like I'm going to play this whole piece perfectly by the end of the session. It's I'm going to be able to play these first two bars very cleanly with a really nice tone by the next 10 minutes. That's attainable. Uh, it's relevant, so it has to be important to what you're doing, and it has to be time bound. So you have to have a clear expectation of what you're doing. A lot of people just say, oh, I'm gonna sit in the practice room and I'm gonna practice for four hours until it's all good. Well, or I'm gonna practice until, until I get it right. Well, if we actually don't make ourselves a timeline, then it's not likely we're going to complete them. Uh, and there's there's something called Parkinson's law, which is a very simple concept that's very intuitive to most people. And it's just this idea that if you have a specific allotted time to do a thing, your efficiency and intensity of work will increase in proportion to the amount of time you have. So if you have 10 minutes to complete a task, you will spend an entire 10 minutes working on what you're trying to achieve with a very small amount of downtime. If you give yourself an hour to achieve an objective, you will work reasonably hard for the first beginning and then it will dip and then it will increase as you reach the deadline. So if you make the timelines very small and you make them very attainable, then things become much more manageable and it's actually much more fun because you get the satisfaction of knowing you actually completed what you're trying to do. But again, making something attainable, maybe two bars is not attainable. Maybe one bar is all you can do for the next 10 minutes. Maybe the first two notes, if it's a very difficult passage, maybe just the parts that you, you can't achieve or you keep messing up, just go, go to those and, and work on them specifically. And for a very advanced people, this, this is not really news to them, but anyway, okay. So cool. So I don't know who he needs to hear this, but you are your own best teacher. Um, as you get more proficient, your, your ears improve and you're able to hear all the things that you want to sound like. So if you don't sound the way you want to sound, you probably have an image in your mind that's pretty strong of what you want to achieve at a very, at a very early level. Most people, their taste is way, way, way more cultivated than their actual skill. And this is, we see this all the time. This is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to learn an instrument when we get older. And it's because we have a clearly defined image of what it means to be a great musician or a great player. And so those expectations are so high that when we start, it's grueling to get through those first moments where we don't sound nearly like what we want to sound like. Yeah, of course. Sometimes even the most advanced players need to be reminded, Nate says. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I, I, I need to be reminded of these things all the time. Uh, it's, it's very, you know, I, I'm telling myself these things and I'm remembering some things for my own self. Okay. So you're your own best teacher. You know what you want to sound like. So always follow your ears, follow your intuition, follow what you want to achieve um, and allow your teacher to help you achieve those goals. Um, if they just prescribe what to do for you, and they give you the answers to everything, you won't necessarily develop this and uh, you won't become the artist and musician you want to be. Oh, I like that. So Kay Fodges says, I just got introduced to smarter goals this year, smarter goals instead of smart goals. So they're the SMART like we have, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound, but they also have ER. E is enjoyable, so we have to make it fun, and resources. 
who will help you and how you can get help. That's a really good point because we don't always know the answers. Um, we want to be our own best teacher, but sometimes there are things we just don't know how to do. And it can take a while to figure some things out. So you can ask people for help. You can ask your teacher for help. You can ask other colleagues for help. You can ask people who are better than you to 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 hear what their opinion is and they can they can help you. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's that's super insightful. I'm going to add that. Okay. So exercise number two, notice your cognitions. So this is a, another exercise. So you can record yourself again, but this time pay attention to your specific symptoms, physiological, cognitive, behavioral, and record them on a sheet of paper. Notice your internal dialogue. Hello, critical, your name, goodbye. So hello, critical Daniel, goodbye. So one thing I might be saying is tachycardia, tachycardia. And then I'll hear myself say, God, you're freaking out. And then I'll say, hello, critical Daniel. Goodbye. And that's it. Um, often that's all it takes to make it stop. Sometimes it takes a little bit more um, carefulness. But again, your mind is like a monkey. They say in Buddhism, your mind is like a monkey. If you uh, just grab the monkey and you try to put it in one place and then forcefully return it, to the center then the monkey will start to fight you and the monkey will always win the monkey is your mind the monkey will always win the monkey is very aggressive and it knows how to take control of the situation when it wants to so you have to be very gentle and you have to be very deliberate so be clear about your expectations move the monkey gently to the place it will run away move it gently to the place and it will run away again move it gently to the place Expect that the monkey will run away. Expect that your mind will run away on you. Expect that your internal dialogue will become increasingly uh, difficult. In fact, in the beginning, you will probably notice that it seems like you're getting worse when you do this exercise because you're coming into contact with your internal dialogue that you might not have been as aware of. So it will feel very loud. Uh, so remember to say hello, critical. Daniel, hello, critical Jim, whoever, and say goodbye, and then return to it again. And, and just notice that every single time you bring your mind back, every time you identify the physiological, cognitive, or behavioral symptom, it's like doing one rep uh, of cognitive focus. So every time you do that, uh, you've done one push-up. So every time you bring your mind back, that's one. And in the beginning, you'll only be able to do five push-ups, ten push-ups. Later on, you can do more. Uh, and it increases all the time. So it's just like anything else. Um, so imagining it also works. Um, imagine You can imagine your cognitions happening. Um, you can... Uh, and then you can, you can face them and say, hello, critical goodbye okay um so you can learn to expect these results as you go on stage and prepare for them beforehand so you've written down all of your behavioral your psych your psycho psycho physiological cognitive symptoms and now you have a kind of catalog of what you're going to do when you get on stage i mean people do change and their symptoms do change over time but in general, you'll kind of have a signature of things that happen to you when you get on stage. So learn to expect them. Don't learn to expect them to disappear. Don't have an eliminative agenda. Just notice that they're going to appear, record them, and be prepared for that experience. No, oh, my hands will get cold. So I am going to wear a sweater. So I'm going to do push-ups before I play. Um, I'm going to go on stage and I'm going to feel like my hands can't move. So I will have to warm up for quite a bit of time before I play. Um, I will forget where my plucking hand is moving. So I have specific exercises for managing my plucking hand. I'm making sure that I have very deliberate motions in my plucking hand. Okay. And just like I said, notice. Yeah, noticing is a muscle. 
You get better at this the more you do it. Okay. So some therapies that have proven effective in managing MPA that already exist include mindfulness, acceptance, commitment, sports psychology. Um, that was one of the first examples of sports psychology that we had uh, in the 80s. And it kind of led to what became acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a larger and uh, a larger treatment for most mental disorders. Cognitive behavioral therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy. And there's also intensive dynamic psychotherapy. Uh, so we'll talk about the first three and some strategies that come from the first three. But the last one is kind of outside of the scope of this. Um, intensive dynamic psychotherapy is a one-in-one -one experience with a psychotherapist and uh, yeah we, we obviously can't do that right here in front of a bunch of people okay also I'm not qualified to do that okay commonalities common assertions between interventions the things these all agree on is the fact that moving in the direction of our values the things we care about helps us achieve our goals and improves our life we have these things called cognitive distortions. They're mistaken ways we see the world and they're just kind of uh, internalized ideas that we have that kind of stick. And they're logical fallacies that don't really uh, add up when we actually observe them, but we really deeply believe them and they're, they've been internalized. It's really hard to uh, get over them. Uh, we, uh, high performance requires our executive function to relinquish control. So. In order to become an optimal performer, to get to the best results of what we're trying to do, um, you have to turn off the part of your brain that is uh, that is judging you. Uh, okay, Doris says, your dad says he never had MPA. Do you have any idea why? Um, well, <laughs> when we're talking to my dad, um, I think uh, I think you have to be in this scenario where it happens often i think uh i i don't know if this is the right forum to to address that question but i, I guess if, if we have to do it like this i would say that um if you don't perform very often you might not have as much experience of this recently so my dad has been relearning piano and it's really important for him to to have been doing that for the last two years and he's doing a great job and it's sounding really cool um but I do notice that when he plays in front of me, he often says that I, he didn't play the way he wanted to, or he didn't play the way he would like to have played. Um, and he says, oh, it sounded better when I was practicing at home. That's an example of music performance anxiety. It's not very subtle. It's not very um, aggravated or, or aggressive, and it doesn't always have to be. Um, those are very subtle symptoms. And just because you have a few symptoms doesn't mean you have music performance anxiety, the disorder. Only about 30% of people have that, but we all experience the symptoms one way or another in some kind of way. So we all experience some kind of impairment when we're performing in front of people. Uh, a lot of people, when they play in rock settings or if they play in environments that are like uh, in, in, in different genres than classical music, then they often won't experience much music performance anxiety because the stakes are not the same. Uh, the expectations from the audience are not the same. Uh, the audience doesn't expect you to be perfect. The audience just expects to have a good time, to have a good show, to hear good music, and the performers expect the same thing. Uh, in classical music, it's less about enjoying yourself as it is about trying to deliver the composer's message, the composer's with a big C, um, the, to deliver the composer's message with absolute clarity and precision. That's not really... Uh, that, that's going to make you more anxious. So I ask him if he's ever had MPA on the piano when he plays for me. That's an interesting question. Are there any people who, who don't feel they have music performance anxiety? Right. I remember how shocked I was the first time I performed classical music. Alex says, yeah, I, I uh, definitely. Yeah. I started with classical guitar when I was 10, so I remember having an experience of that. But I always remember playing rock music and feeling it was much more easy, much more more enjoyable. But my standards were not so high. I was not listening to myself so carefully. I was not 
uh, doing things like that. Yeah, Alex says, I'd done dozens of shows as a teenager in rock settings where I felt powerful and excited to perform. And that's the other thing about rock settings. When we're performing in, in jazz musician, in jazz or, or rock, often the audience is uh, not looking for a perfect experience. And, and, and so the culture is very different and people aren't playing the exact same thing. The other thing about classical music is that it tends to be patronized by people who play classical music or who, who are uh, really uh, like connoisseurs of classical music. So they know the pieces very well and you're trying to meet those expectations, those recording expectations very high. Ian says, I would say the same. No problem playing with a band. Solo classical guitar is a way different experience. Uh, AJ Vega Let's Go says, I had it horrible as a kid. I would instantly shake, but the more concerts I played, the more I in control I was. Totally. Classical music is a completely different experience. You're also totally by yourself. For anybody who's done classical musician, classical guitar particularly, you're playing a very quiet instrument in front of people who are mostly guitarists. And when you're playing, it's very, very difficult to... Uh, it's very difficult whenever you make a mistake. You can't really hide it in any sort of way. So, Nalco says, replying to Doris Almeida, his enthusiasm of playing of, of playing music overcomes MPA, perhaps? She has a more positive approach to it. Maybe he just enjoys playing music, and uh, that's why. I'd say the thing, like, if your stake is not high in it, if you're not doing it because it's like a career, or you're not doing it because you feel you have to, or you're trying to prove anything to other people, or you're trying to do competitions or things like that, then it's very normal that you're not going to experience it very much. If you don't have your entire life on the line for this, then it's a different thing. But when you're getting paid for a performance pretty well, and then you know that if you really mess up the performance that people will stop hiring you, that's a very different thing. Um, Sarah... Uh, says true on the Wacken stage of the largest r largest metal festival it's a European metal festival um, Sarah played it with her band um, I didn't feel nervous but classical now I get very nervous maybe also an identity issue for me making my identity more as a rocker in the last 13 years yeah I think having multiple identities is really helpful too so we have these things called social schemas or uh, yeah and and basically, we have different versions of ourselves that exist. So there's Daniel the musician, Daniel the doctoral student, Daniel the friend, Daniel the partner of Nauco, Daniel the many, many other things. We have many different hats that we wear in our life, right? And the more hats we have, the more damage we can take when one of them crumbles. So if our entire life is built around being a musician or a classical musician, then anything that damages that fragile ego will be very damaging to the whole person. If that's, if your classical musician is a big thing and then you have a tiny, tiny bit of being family person, friend, things like this, then it's not as much to worry about. But when this whole thing, your whole life is riding on this one thing, it becomes very, very scary. And so, yeah, very interesting. But it is interesting that in rock music, in classical, in other non-classical genres, people seem to not experience as much mu music performance anxiety. I, I feel the exact same thing. Hey, Silas, how's it going? Um, great. I, I can't actually see who's entering the chat as they enter, but it's great to, uh, great to see. Yeah, cool. So, uh, so we have all these common assertions between the different uh, therapies that work with music performance anxiety. Okay, cool. So mindfulness-based meditation can help us accomplish the third goal, which is to uh, relinquish our executive function, to actually turn off the thinking, decision-making part of our brain, and to just let it flow. Okay. So exercise three is create a mantra. This one's very simple. You just identify three things that you like uh, about your own playing that you would like to offer your audience. What are three, th hey, hey Silas, how's it going? Um, identify three things about you that you feel you would like to offer your audience and what matters to you. Okay, 
So I'm just going to respond to these comments. So Patrick says, I find it a lot easier to get into a flow state when playing with a band, even when playing solos and conspicuous parts. That feeling of losing yourself in the music is something that I can hardly overreach when performing classical. Definitely. Definitely understand that. Alexandre says, multiple identities are crucial. I agree. In the last months, it made a huge difference for me when I forced when I was forced to take a break from my instrument. The worst thing you can do is to only identify as a classical music musician. It is very destructive. Interestingly enough, in classical music, the idea of only being a classical musician, whatever that means, is something very new. Um, to only be a performer and not to be an improviser and a uh, composer and to be an arranger and all the other things that we can be to only be a performer is somewhat destructive and it's very very difficult for us to bank our entire life on that thing because it's so fragile i mean yeah okay so step one identify three things about you that you feel you would like to offer your audience and what matters to you this this last question what matters to you is a values question who or what matters to you you can also add who um, what are the things that matter to you and what are you trying to get towards? We'll, we'll do more with this in a moment. But for me, I identify three things about you, about myself that I would like to offer the audience. Um, whenever I go on stage, I, this is a mantra I say to myself, I say, focus, precision, passion. Those are the things I want. I want to be focused. I want to be with the experience while it's happening. I want to be present for it. I want to be precise. I want to hit the notes. I want to feel like, you know, I, I did a service to the music. In that way and I want to feel passionate I want to I want to actually express the emotion to express the the feelings that are happening in in the in the music so th that's the 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 mantra I go in with every time I play does anybody else have three things that they would like to share about themselves that they'd like to do for their mantra Right, three things that you would like to offer your audience. This is very difficult. What are three things we like about ourselves? Three things that we think matter in the music. For me, it's focus, precision, passion. They can be the same. They can be different. They can be completely opposite. It doesn't matter to me. All that matters is that they're strongly held for you. <laughs> AJ Vega says. Does anyone ever lose appetite before concerts? But <laughs> Yeah, I kind of lose my appetite before playing. I feel like I don't want to corrupt myself before I play or something. Um Luke Robertson says Bud Light, please. <laughs> you would so Luke would like to offer the audience a Bud Light. I I I respect that. <laughs> Silas says I just think about trying to feel I, I like that. Just trying to feel. Just trying to feel your emotions. Trying to let them happen. Nate says, sincerity is one. I don't know about the three, but sincerity is one. I like that. Being honest. And these are all values that we all share. These are all values that everybody has. It's really cool. Okay. So step two, use that mantra to help ground you during your performance, saying it often during stressful or distracting moments. Visceral, connect, passion, Silas says. Visceral, connect, passion. You want the pa you want the performance to be visceral. You want it to connect with people. You want it to be passionate. I like that. Alex says vulnerability is a huge one for me. Alex says authenticity. Elisa says fun. I like this. And it says a lot about everyone, what, what, what they really value, you know? Um, these things are all important, you know? Uh, yeah, enjoying yourself while you play. It's not so serious, right? It's just music, right? Nobody's going to die. If we play this and we play for people, no, no one is going to die. <laughs> Nothing, it's, it's not that serious, really, when it comes down to it. Although we take it very seriously. When we're on stage, it doesn't matter anymore because our preparation is done. Okay? Often we'll have these moments of lack of focus when we're performing and this mantra can help you 
<laughs> Nate says, replying to Elisa Tersenyi, oh yeah, it's supposed to be fun. <laughs> yeah, we forget that. It's really, really easy to forget that. Um, I often see it as like this religious mission or something, but it's, it's really, it's really not. It's, it's really not. It's a really great way to stress yourself out. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, so here we have a life map. So this is from acceptance and commitment therapy. It's from a, a, a textbook that has this. <laughs> Alex says, "Wait, what?" <laughs> Replying to Elisa. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, having fun with music is not obvious. <laughs> being a fish in water right isn't that isn't that what everyone says to you when you talk to them in the taxi so oh you must love being a musician you just do what you love right so nice you're always playing having fun so much fun (laughs) i'm not i'm not always having fun okay so we have this life map and i i just if you want to take the time if you have a paper and pencil handy you can do this now or you can do this later doesn't matter um we can do this together we're going to do this together. Um, and you can see that there's numbers one, two, three, and four. You can see my mouse following that. And then in the middle, we have me noticing. Okay, so there's this big line in the middle. And everything beneath this line is what's underneath. So this is in your internal experiences, um, what's happening inside your mind, essentially. And Everything above the the line is external experiences. So these are things we do in the physical world. Okay, so the first thing we want to identify here, uh, the other thing is that there's these, these, these sides are divided left and right as well. So this is going towards the future and this is going towards the past, right? Future, past, okay? So the first thing we do is we identify who and what is most important to you. Some of you have already done this. So authenticity, fun, (laughs) vulnerability, visceral, connect, passion. This is really what your mantra is about, right? Identifying your values. Sincerity, Bud Light. (laughs) Uh, Does anyone else have some values? Who or what matters to you? It can be people. Does anybody care about people? I care about Naoko. Naoko is a person that matters to me. Who who are who are people who and what are are, are most important to you? Draw me I know. This is a, it's a psychological exercise. Who and what is most important to you? <laughs> That's an inside joke between me and Alex. Draw me a house, Daniel. I have this party trick where you draw me a house and I can tell you things about your life. It's not related to this. Who and what is most important to you? Okay. I'll start then. I can say um, music is important to me. Performing well is important to me. Uh, Being a happy, balanced person is important to me. Chang says, I love your draw me a house trick, Daniel. Thank you. Oh, Alex says, Uplifting others, being a positive imprint. I definitely like that. Who and what is most important to you? That's great. And it, and, it, and it's totally about you. It doesn't it doesn't have to be something that that everyone shares. It can just be an individual thing. I I'm not in a place to say what is good and what is bad. Who and what is most important to you? Being inspiring to others is important to me. I want others... I kind of play music that's really, like, really big and difficult. Sometimes I want to inspire others. I want to inspire my students. I want people to look at classical guitar and say, I want to play classical guitar. That's something that matters to me. Some people interpret that as shallow. That's fine. Something that is important to me. What is something that is important to you? Oh, Alex, I missed your answer. Family, friends, teachers letting go and having peace of mind i like that family friends teachers yeah my teachers are important to me of course i want to impress them i want to do them justice to all the work they've put into like helping me play guitar 
friends where would you be without them family that raised you kept you kept you alive letting go having peace of mind these are important to you okay so from there that's in the future right that's those that's the direction we want to go <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. We don't. This you can just do this by yourself. It doesn't have to be in the chat. You don't have to broadcast it to the world. It's fine. So we're gonna go to the left now. So now we're gonna go. What thoughts, feelings, or sensations get in the way of moving forward? So we all have things that take us away from the things we value internally. So these are internal things. What thoughts, feelings, or sensations get in the way? Ful Luke says fulfillment, accomplishment. Those are values. What thoughts, feelings, or sensations get in the way of moving forward? For me, I can say they're the feeling that I'm not good enough, that there are so many great guitarists in the world, I don't deserve to be on this stage. Feelings or sensations get in the way of moving forward. I'll play this perfectly so it's not worth doing. Uh, the feeling that nobody's going to understand this music, so why do I even play it? Um... This music makes, um, I need to be better than this other player. That's another thing that I often feel. Um, those are things that get in the way of me moving forward. If I don't do this well enough, no one will ever hire me again. No one will ever, um, ask me to play. Other values Luke shares, Bud Light equipment malfunctions. <laughs> Oh, okay. I see. <laughs> what are thought? Those are thoughts, feelings, or sensations that get in the way of moving forward. The uh, actually, Luke, that that's great. But those actually belong in in quadrant three at the top because those are actual things that exist in the world. Um, so alcohol <laughs> and equipment malfunctions, those 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 move uh move you away from. Uh, th those are yeah. I guess those that's a feeling or sensation that it takes you away. Ah, the imposter syndrome, of course. Nate says, really, uh, the feeling that people will realize that you've been faking this whole time. <laughs> Alex says, replying to Nate Brett as an imposter syndrome. Luke Robertson. Those get in the way. Yeah, those are things that get in the way. Absolutely. You're totally right. Yeah. Um, Alex says, impression of not being worthy of my teacher's time, of never being able to imitate a recording, the idea that I'm a prisoner of my music performance anxiety. That you can never escape your music performance anxiety. That's a that's a very very common experience, and it's very understandable. That 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 is something that definitely keeps us from moving forward. Um, very understandable. Alec says worries that you've plateaued or cannot get back to where you used to be. Oof, this is a big one for me. That's one I experience all the time. Uh, I often feel like, oh, why can't I practice like I was an undergrad? Why can't I practice like I, I was when I would practice 12 hours a day and just cut off everything from my life? Even though I probably play better now. Um, what thoughts, feelings, or sensations get in the way of moving forward? Those are all really important ones. Those are great answers. Okay, so what do we do to move away from these difficult experiences? So here we have things. We can divide these number three into two possibilities. So we have these are experiential avoidances. These are things that we do to make those difficult inner experiences stop. So there's an equipment malfunction. Um, we're drinking too much. We have imposter syndrome. We feel like we've plateaued. We can't back, get back to where we, where we should be. What do we do to move away from those difficult experiences? Um, so we can say things that are helpful and say things that are not helpful. They're both types of experiential avoidance. We're trying to avoid this experience, but some are adaptive and some are maladaptive for me um i feel overeating is actually one i, I find i eat a lot before a performance I, I find i'm irritable with others before performances i find uh these are things that i try to do to stop myself from thinking about the performance i will often um just stop working on the things that matter to me i'll develop weird obsessions that are not related to anything i'm doing um I will often feel like I need to distance myself from others, like others are a distraction or they're getting in the way of my achievements or the things I'm trying to do. Um, those are things that take me away from the things that I value. They often take me away from the people I care about and they don't improve my life. So um, those are things that I do to take myself away um, that are not adaptive. Now, there are some that are adaptive. 
Um, some of them are practicing my instrument. Some of them are working on the specific parts of the pieces that I need to work on to pulling out my practice journal and actually like working out the specific details of what I need to work on. Those are things that help me move towards um, my goals. Uh, uh, but those those also move me away from those experiences as well. So they're adaptive as well. So what are some things you do to take you away from those thoughts, feelings, or sensations that get in the way of moving forward? It can be good or bad. It's a hard one. You have to think about it sometimes. Sometimes we're in the water. We can't even swim. We can't even notice we're swimming. Alex says, no one should practice 12 hours a day. <laughs> yes, I agree with you. <laughs> it didn't make me better. All right. It's getting cold in this one. All right. So we can think about those things on our own. Some Oh, procrastination. Absolutely. Procrastination. I mean, that, that isn't that what that is, right? We're trying to not think about what we have to do because what we do is scary and it's a big task that is difficult to achieve. So we will react by procrastinating, by doing something that is completely unrelated, totally understandable. Helplessness, feeling like we can't do it, like we don't have what it takes. Um, just giving up, like kind of doing something else, trying to avoid thinking. Hmm. Alex says physical and spiritual improvement do stuff for a short time that takes you 100% out of that headspace do it because you want to don't think of it as an end to improve your music Alex says for number three I redirect negative emotions into positive ones every time Every time I feel a negative emotion, I stop to acknowledge its existence and try to choose to not give any attention to it. Uh, Alex says, Daniel, how much would you say the heightened mediatization and monetization of music affects these symptoms? Please feel free to not answer or answer later if this is not an appropriate time. I think this is a good time. Um, this is a difficult one, but I feel that these, these things are all related. Um, I feel sometimes that I feel under pressure to play pieces that I don't really think are deep or meaningful because I feel that audiences enjoy them more. Um, sometimes I feel a little bit of a pressure to um, like go against my values and do the thing that is popular rather than the thing that is actually meaningful to me. Uh, for me, playing JS Bach is what makes me happier than anything else. I know a lot of people don't like it, so sometimes I don't always play it. Sometimes I I I, I shy away from uh, sharing that with others because it's something uh, I care about so much. But I realize that it's very complex music; it's not always accessible to everybody. So uh, that that's something that I find can be difficult. Uh, values, um, the monetization of music, uh, mediatization, monetization of music. Yeah, well, it's it's very difficult to chase our values and make them a part of our life because it's very difficult to make money with them. And the ways we make money with them are often not ways that are as honest or as fulfilling as we want them to be. We often can't follow the things that we want to do. We have to follow certain patterns. I think there's a way to do it to to have your cake and eat it too. Uh, it's kind of, but it's very, very difficult. <laughs> Patrick says, please, who doesn't like Bach? Well, actually, surprisingly, a lot of people. <laughs> I, I, I I agree. It's, it feels incorrect to me, but a lot of people tell me, like, they're, you play a little bit too much Bach. Maybe you should play something else. Alex says, right? <laughs> yeah. Hey. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Okay. So, so number four um, is going in the direction of our values now. So this is pretty obvious. What could you do to move towards what's important to you? And I think a lot of people have already answered this. Um, this is, uh, Alex said, physical and spiritual improvement. Do stuff for a short time that takes you 100% out of that headspace. 
do it because you want to. Don't think of it as an ends to improve your music. Um, what are some things that take you towards your values? So some of you have said your values are accomplishment, fulfillment, uplifting others, being a positive imprint, family, friends, teachers, letting go and having peace of mind. Uh, fun, <laughs> fun, remember that one. What takes you towards those things? Nate says, a sort of strange one for me, I think he's talking about number three, is just practicing technique instead of my rep. Like, it's easier to just move the fingers through exercises than to actually face the work of improving pieces. Fixating on small things like posture or hand positioning instead of actually playing. Yeah, no, that's number three. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think that's that's very, very common. I used to do that all the time. I used to feel like I had to practice two hours a day of technique. Uh, not true. I mean, one hour is good. I mean, it's good to be in physical shape. But imagine you were doing a martial art and you only lifted weights, but you didn't practice punches. That would be very strange. Um, if you imagine if you only. Yeah, imagine if you only practice skills and then you couldn't read music, it would be very, very bizarre. So we, a lot of the things we do in our, our music are much more nuanced than the, than the simple exercises we have to go through. So it can be a lot. And I feel, I, I feel that. And I, what's important about Nate's answer is it highlights something very interesting. There's this gray area. Sometimes things look like they are positive things, like they are adaptive, like they are useful to us, that they are taking us towards our values because we're doing the things that we're being told we're supposed to do. We're supposed to t practice technique. But if we do it in a way that is excessive, Sometimes it can take us away from the things we're doing. Sometimes we're actually avoiding the things we actually care about, which is the music, making the music nice. And I totally agree with you. I, I think that that's great. Um, that's a really good, insightful answer. Yeah, I, I find that there are a lot of ways you can justify doing what you're doing. And, and, and yeah, Alex says, replying to Nate Bredesen, that one's rough since it's easily justifiable for oneself, myself included, obviously, myself too. I've definitely done things like that. Um, okay, um, so what can you do to move towards what's important to you? Alex said, a solid change of attitude should do it. Okay, how should we change our attitude? What should we do? I mean, everyone is different here because Every, everyone has different values. How do we get towards our values? All right, accomplishment, fulfillment, uplifting others, being a positive imprint, family, friends, teachers, letting go, having peace of mind, fun, authenticity, vulnerability, visceral, connect, passion. How do we get to these things? What are some actions we can do? Of course, practicing. Of course, practicing our instrument, um, effectively doing the things that we're, we're supposed to do and, and so on. Um, easier said than done. But uh, yeah, how, what, what brings us closer to the people in our life that we care about? What about things like that? Alex says, I find it's good to have honest conversations with our audience members and students. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I, I think that often we're trying to create a persona that is like a perfect person. This image of a person who is uh, supposed to be, you know, flawless and and has no fear and so on. But it's it's often very different than reality. And so we train other people to expect that in themselves and it's unrealistic. And so I think I agree. So your, your, one of your values was authenticity. And you said, I find it's good to have honest conversations with our audience members and students. Yeah, totally. Anybody else? Hey, well, hey Megan, how's it going? Great. So we're drawing a life map here. 
Um, so Alex says, we tend to ignore compliments and downplay our abilities, but really paying attention to authentic appreciation can help. Definitely. I found the best compliments I've ever experienced were when people just said, thank you. Thank you for the music. Thank you. Like, like they're acknowledging that it's service. They acknowledge that I'm doing something for them and, and it took work and so on and so on. And it was a gift and so on. It's very nice. Alex says, it's essential, I believe, to think long term rather than short term. I often have the tendency to have an all or nothing mindset. By thinking long term, it helps me to let go and live a more balanced life. I totally agree. We'll, we'll uh, go in that direction in a second. Okay, so this life map is really intense. So if you want to, if you want, you can always look at this on YouTube or whatever and copy it down and, you know, make it for your own life. You can do it with other things. It doesn't have to just be about music. Uh, in the middle is noticing. So you have to just... You have to always pay attention to your thoughts. That's number five. Um, always make sure you see uh, your thoughts. You can identify your cognitive, physiological, behavioral symptoms. Uh, identify what's important to you. Identify what you care about. Okay. So, uh, Nate says, I don't know if this is what you were looking for, but I always try to imagine how 10-year-old me would think if he saw me playing today. Um, I, I think that is what I'm looking for. You know, it, it doesn't have to be a specific thing that would be in my life. It's uh, for you specifically. Trung says, practicing, but also take a moment to assess the level of stress and seek ways to relieve it. Yeah, absolutely. Overworking ourselves just because we feel we have to doesn't necessarily achieve our goals. Sometimes if we break ourselves we actually stop altogether and we have to take care of the the long-term goals like like Alex was saying okay this is great cool so here we have um, this is a part of cognitive behavioral therapy so we have these cognitive distortions here and um, uh, I'll just zoom them in a little bit so you can see them just gonna do that there Good. So we can go through them one, one, one by one. So we have mental filtering. That's um, how do the positives outweigh the negatives in this instance? The tendency to focus on negative events while neglecting the positives. So we do that all the time in our playing. We say, um, we say, oh, you know, someone says, oh, you know, I really liked what you did in that section. Oh, no, it was all garbage. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? You're lying. We're meant. We're just filtering out what we're seeing in our mind jumping to conclusions the tendency to make irrational assumptions about people and circumstances um yeah it's, it's very it's very common uh and if anybody has any examples of these I, I think it'd be great to if you have them in your own life um personalization it's the tendency to take the blame for absolutely everything that goes wrong in your life this is very common for people who have not had a lot of control in their life or who need to uh, feel like they're in control of life. It's a very normal feeling. Um, so uh, let's say you have an equipment malfunction. You say, oh, I'm just an idiot. I'll never, it's all because I didn't, I didn't prepare. I didn't have the, I didn't have my pedals lined up in exactly the right way, but it wasn't your fault that the, the power ran out for a second. Okay, uh, black and white thinking, the tendency to see things as all or nothing things as either good or bad, right or wrong. It's either perfect or it sucks. It's a very common feeling people have. Catastrophizing. Uh, the tendency to blow circumstances out of proportion by making problems larger than life. Um, this, if I don't play flawlessly at this concert, my career is over. Catastrophizing. Oh, thanks, man. See, see you. Nate says, I'm sorry, Daniel, I have to sign off, but I'm really looking forward to catching the rest when you upload it. And it's almost done anyways. And then we have overgeneralizing. That's the tendency to make broad generalizations based upon a single event without minimal evidence. Labeling. The tendency to make global statements about yourself or others based upon... Uh, based upon situation specific behavior. So um, yeah, that kind of player, that player always does that sort of thing. Um, that kind of person is always gonna play like that. That kind of person is always gonna be like that. 
I'm just the kind of person that just makes mistakes. I'm just the kind of person that isn't able to play on stage. I don't have what it takes to be a musician. That's labeling. Um, Alexander says, feeling entitled to only have good performances and not accepting the reality that I will only be truly satisfied with few performances. We have shoulding and musting. Um, I should be able to do this if I get on stage. I should be able to do this if I get on stage. I uh, should be working this much in order to get the results I need to. Sometimes it's rational, but more often it's it's just forcing uh, a standard on yourself that's not the same as everyone else. Emotional reasoning, the tendency to imper interpret your reasoning based upon how you're feeling in the moment. So uh, this is actually a really interesting one. Number nine, uh, I have a very interesting story with this. One time I was playing in a music com in a competition and I got first place and I, I felt absolutely terrible. I felt like I, I failed. I, I was, it was a garbage performance because I made a few mistakes and I, I just felt like I, I, I will get last place for sure. And I got first place. And that was because emotional reasoning was telling me that I didn't feel good when I was playing. And I didn't. But because of that, I thought that that was actually what reality was. But it didn't actually reflect reality. And that happens to us a lot. Okay. So let's go to the next one. Almost done here. There are many other cognitive distortions that exist. But one plagues musicians in a particularly in intense way. My playing ability equals my self-worth. That's the core of music performance anxiety. That's the core philosophy that drives it. I mean, um, if I don't play well, I'm not a good I'm not a good person. I don't deserve love. I don't deserve achievement. I don't deserve anything. Um, you are not the music. You play the music. You share the music, but your playing has nothing to do with your self worth. So, if you take away all the behaviors and patterns that you find problematic, there's still much more to do to play at our best. We want to create the conditions for flow. So, in order to do this. We have to, oops, I'm going to make this a little smaller. It's running way over. Okay. We want to create the conditions for flow. We want to have complete concentration on the task, clarity of goals and reward in mind and immediate feedback. Think a game. We want to have a clear goal and we want to achieve it very quickly. Uh, transformation of time, speeding up, slowing down. That's one of the experiences we have in flow. The experience is intrinsically rewarding, effortless, with ease. If you've ever experienced this, let me know. Um, there is a balance between challenge and skills. Actions and awareness are merged, losing self-consciousness, rumination. Some people feel like like the I, the ident your identity was, was dissolved in the music. There's a feeling of control over the task. And it feels like no matter what you're doing, you can't make a mistake. You're just playing really, really well. Everything's going well. So this is flow. Megan says, I find the more music I play, the more I learn about myself in terms of my capabilities, my drive, my habits, etc. If that makes sense. I totally agree. I think music is a vehicle for self-development if we do it right. And I, I think that's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. How to attain flow. So, so we're talking all about flow and how great it is. Um, how do we achieve it? It's when our thinking mind talked about this again our executive function becomes less active. We have very few distractions. We have clear, actionable goals that are challenging, but not overwhelming. Um, places where we often experience flow easily include video games, doing exercise, if you've ever done push-ups, um, music, performing arts, work, spending time with other people. These things can all create flow. Having a good conversation with others can create flow. All these things. Okay. So we have here what's called the flow channel. And in order to achieve optimal performance, we need to find the space in the middle there, in that little area between challenge and skills. So when our skills are very high and our challenge is very high, we're still in the flow channel, right? It's still good. But what happens if our skills are very low and our challenge is very high? We have a lot of anxiety and that's very normal. Right? If imagine doing a task that playing a piece that's way too hard for you. The challenge is very high and maybe your skills are not able to achieve it. You're going to experience anxiety. Now, let's say you play a piece that's a beginner level piece and you're an extremely advanced player. Um, you're going to experience boredom. 
it's going to have a, because you have a very high level of skill and a very low level of challenge. So you want to have a level of challenge that's sufficient to achieve this flow and a level of skill that is sufficient to achieve the skill. Yeah, being able to, um, Patrick, regarding flow said, definitely experienced this before. Very rarely in classical performance, though, and being able to achieve it regularly is a huge goal. Definitely, I agree. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of unrealistic to expect it all the time, but it is something that can be achieved. Um, so what we have to do is we have to be playing, we have to have practice, essentially. We have to have developed enough skills that we feel we can do the thing well enough. But the piece has to be difficult enough that we're still thinking about it. It has to be difficult enough that we still feel a challenge. Maybe not an overwhelming challenge, but just a strong challenge. Um, such that we, we were stimulated by the activity. Patrick says, choral singing and other ensemble performances are really good for flow, personally. I totally agree with you. I think it's much easier to achieve flow in a performance with, that's with an ensemble, with other people, because you can have your goal be listening to others and you can connect with others very easily. When you connect with others, it's very easy. When you're all by yourself, um, there's a lot of pressure on just you and you have no one else to turn to. You can't redirect your focus into something that you have uh, no control over because uh, you have control over every aspect of what you're doing and you're totally responsible for everything you're doing. So it's very stressful. But flow can definitely be achieved. When we're, when we're by ourselves, so I've definitely experienced it. Okay, so um, so now we're we're gonna end the whole thing with a mindfulness meditation. So we're we're just gonna do five minutes because we're running way over time. And um, I'm gonna sit comfortably on a chair or on the ground with your back straight. I'm gonna sit on a chair here just so I, you can all see me. Normally I would sit on a cushion. Um, and this exercise is just to teach us how to notice our thoughts very clearly and to become aware of them to just be comfortable with the noise and to identify the thoughts and to gradually allow them allow ourselves to be less reactive to the thoughts so sit on, comfortably on a chair or on the ground with your back straight for me i take my uh, two thumbs and i raise them uh, i meet them here and then i Put them to waist level. And then, um, so then close your eyes or leave them nearly closed and bring your attention to the breath. And notice your distractions and reward yourself every time you return to the breath. So whenever you get distracted and say, distracted, 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 and return, that's one rep, that's one push up. So just say, good job, and that's it, okay? As your focus increases, expand your awareness, pay attention to metal, mental and physical sensations, labeling them with an ing word. So make whatever it is that's happening to you into a verb. Fearing, worrying, thinking, so on. And we'll just do this. I'll just set the timer so we can do this for five minutes. Okay. Five minutes. Not a very long time. It's just enough time. There, and I'm going to start right now, okay? Notice your thoughts, feelings, sensations, 
notice your feet. Notice the way they feel as they touch the ground, or if you're cross-legged as they touch your legs. your attention to your knees. Try to see if you can feel the fabric of your clothing against your knees. Label the sensation with an ING word and return to the breath. Notice the feeling of your stomach, how it expands when you breathe in and contracts when you breathe out. To go higher, notice your heart beating if you can. Try to feel your chest and feel it beating against your solar plex. your hands, how they feel with the thumbs touching. Can you feel the blood flowing into your fingers? your attention to the breath. Yeah, that was five minutes. That was a very, very short time. So gradually relax your focus and open your eyes and return to your awareness. And this process is not about trying to achieve the objective of having the longest time focusing. It's just about being able to return to the breath 
as many times as you can. So we would focus on different parts of the body and return to the breath. And gradually, as we do this more and more, we can start to feel the whole body. It's called a body scan. Uh, as we feel the whole body, we can notice the subtle sensations that are happening. And this kind of trains us in many ways for music performance anxiety. For when we get on stage and when we have this natural hyper awareness that is kind of shocking for us. So to be able to do this at home is really important so that you can become accustomed to that feeling. So um, if you, uh, what are some experiences some of you have had with this? We're just gonna, before we um, finish up, this is the last few minutes for everybody, anybody who's with me. I know the numbers have declined a little bit. Still got, still got a bunch of people on Twitch and on Facebook, but uh, fewer than before. Did anyone uh, fall asleep during this exercise? <laughs> think everybody fell asleep <laughs> okay well if you're still doing it that's great uh if you if you wake up that's great but uh i just want to thank everyone for coming to this uh yeah we were gonna yeah so i just want to thank everybody for coming to this uh oh that's great great alec my, my shoulders relax probably for the first time today. That's, that's excellent. That's wonderful. Meditation is such a powerful tool. You were tempted to fall asleep, Elisa. I understand. I understand. It's totally understandable. It's happened to me many, many times. Um, great. So if anybody has any questions, um, just, just before the whole thing is over, anything that I haven't maybe addressed, everybody's been very, very talkative. Nah, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> Ali, <laughs> Elisa. Thank you, Daniel. Very helpful. Yeah, so that went way way longer than I expected, but I'm really glad for everybody who stayed the whole time and for everybody who just visited, who just saw it for a little bit. It was really great to see you all there. Um, and uh, yeah, so this whole series is called The Concerts for the End of Time. If you really like it, please contribute. Um, there's a PayPal link paypal.me slash concerts for end of time there's no the it's on the uh, facebook event uh but if you if you can't contribute that's totally fine there's no there's no reason you have to it's just it's just what you can if you want and uh uh we will have some more performers coming soon so on april 25th me and malco will be playing a uh, guitar marimba recital which is gonna be cool and then uh after AJ Vega uh, will be playing. Alejandro Vega, uh, excellent solo guitarist, will be playing uh, on May 2nd. He'll be performing a solo concert of Cuban works, um, many other things like that. And on the 16th, we'll have Brent Crawford, excellent guitarist, um, international guitar competition winner, extraordinaire, awesome guitarist. A April, um, May 30th, we'll have Nate Bredesen, also, who is also here in the chat, very great guitarist. And, uh, yeah, and we'll, we'll also have Carol Tsai after that, a cellist from living in Bamberg, Germany, not too long after that. So thank you, everybody, for being there. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you had a great experience. Thanks, Alec. Thanks, Alex. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Alejandro, Elisa, everyone who is here, Megan, Chong, Nate, all these people. Thank you so much. It was really wonderful to have you here. And uh, I really had a good time. And thank you for making it so enjoyable with all your awesome stories and things like this. So, uh, yeah, if you're looking for this in the future or you want a, more information, it's on the, the YouTube event will be shared. So it will be on my YouTube page. So youtube.com slash Danny Ramstan. Oh, and thank you, Sir Kato Blubai. He's a sweet, Swedish guy, awesome uh, follower of the channel. Um, and I really, really love seeing all of you here. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Okay, Thanks, Philip.